not just those that others speak to us, but the ones that we speak ourselves. And she'll answer this question from Twitter. Rachel asks, I've been praying for God's help through his healing and power over anxiety. Why am I not experiencing his promises of peace in my life? Well, Rachel, God's promises are absolutely true. And there are always different things happening in our lives that sometimes make it hard for us to see him moving or to really get to where we want to go. So today we're going to discover some of the possible solutions to your dilemma as Joyce answers the question, do the words I say matter? I have a grandson that's a little over three and he had gotten a hold of a bunch of pictures of me from a photo session I had done and so he put stickers on the pictures for me and I know you can't see this but you get the point when he brought it to my house to surprise me every sticker was over my mouth <laughs> I mean every picture the stickers over my mouth I thought well God are you trying to tell me something This is an area where we will always be growing our whole life. No man can tame the tongue, the Bible says. You say, well then, if I can't tame my tongue, what's the point in teaching me to? Well, here's the thing. If you want to, if you really want to do what's right and use your mouth for a godly purpose, and if you'll pray about it, and if you will study in this area, God will do the work that needs to be done. But don't think that you can just make a decision to go home and shut up and everything is going to change because I went through that over and over and I actually got worse instead of better. We cannot change by works of the flesh. We can only change when we let the Holy Spirit work in our life to bring the changes that need to be brought. You and God are partners and you cannot do it without Him. God's not going to let us have victories without Him because if we try to, then we're going to take the credit. Tonight in particular, I want to talk to you about words and how they, affect, how they affect the anointing on your life or how they affect the power and the presence of God on your life. The Holy Spirit brings the anointing of God into our lives. And that anointing, that power, that presence of God on our lives, in our lives and on our lives, is one of the most precious gifts that we have. The presence of God in your life, the power of God that is in you and on you for whatever you need to do is the most precious thing that you have in your life and you must protect it. The power of God on our lives needs to be reverenced, honored, and protect it. And one of the ways that we can do great damage to that beautiful anointing is by having a mixture in our life. Praising God when we're in church and singing all these songs and quoting scriptures and hearing the word and then going out and gossiping about people and being judgmental and critical and negative and murmuring and complaining and speaking all kinds of doubt and unbelief. Are we all together on the same page? We need to get rid of the mixture. You say a few things good and the power starts to increase in your life. Then you say a few things negative and it decreases and goes back to zero. <laughs> we have to get consistent in saying what God says. It's not about just saying anything we want to say, but learning how to say what God says. And no matter how impossible it seems to us, when we read one of God's promises in the Word, the only thing that He wants to hear from us is, I agree with you, God. If you say that you can do that, then I believe that you can do that. It may be impossible with man, but all things are possible with God. We have to learn how to come into agreement with God. Some of you are sitting in church week after week and you're watching my program and you've even come to this conference and you so desperately need God to work in your life and you, and you want to 
but I can tell you it was this way in my life and I'm not trying to insult you, I'm trying to help you. You just keep digging in deeper with your own mouth. It doesn't do any good just to hear somebody say it. You've got to learn to say what God says. The whole reason to hear the Word of God is so you can learn to say what God says. The Word of God in your mouth, spoken out loud in faith, is your number one most powerful weapon against the enemy. If you want to defeat the devil, you have to learn how to speak the Word. Not speak what you feel, not speak what you think, not speak what people tell you, but the Word of God. Anybody can have the promises of God fulfilled in their lives if they will learn how to come into agreement with God, to do what God tells you to do and to say what God says. Amen. Proverbs 18, 21 says, the power of life and death are in the tongue. Tonight I'm going to kind of lay a foundation and talk to you about this the anointing on our lives and the importance of maintaining that anointing. I think today there's probably even a good number of people that don't even really know what the anointing is. Well, Christ is called the anointed one. He, th that's what the word Christ means, the anointed one. Jesus, the anointed one, and the anointing, the power of God. The Holy Spirit was sent to represent Jesus when Jesus went to heaven to sit at the Father's right hand. He is the presence of God. When we feel the presence of God, when we're singing these beautiful worship songs, that's the Holy Spirit in our midst. When you feel or sense the power of God on you to do something that you need to do, that's the presence of God coming on your life to help you and enable you to do what you need to do. And the more you agree with God, the more power is going to be released in your life. Let's look at Luke 1, verse 11. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear took possession of him. But the angel said to him, don't be afraid, Zechariah, because your petition was heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. Now, he's been praying for something that when God tells him he's about to get it, he won't believe God. Have you ever prayed for something and then when you get it, you say, I just can't believe that? <laughs> well, why are we praying if we're not expecting and believing God to do something? Your petition has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will call his name John, which means God is favorable. And you shall have joy and exultant delight and many will rejoice over his birth for he will be great and distinguished in the sight of the Lord. And he must drink no wine nor strong drink, and he will be filled with and controlled by the Holy Spirit, even in and from his mother's womb. And he will turn back and cause to return many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. And I mean, right about now, Elijah, I mean, Zechariah should have been just hopping up and down inside like, whoa, praise the Lord, exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond. I just asked for a child, but I'm going to get a famous one. Verse 17, and he will himself go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah, him, he was talking about the Savior, to turn back the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient and the incredulous and the unpersuadable to the wisdom of the upright, which is the knowledge and the holy love of the will of God, in order to make ready for the Lord a people perfectly prepared in spirit, adjusted and disposed and placed in the right moral state. He's, he's telling him, and your son, this child that you've prayed for, is going to be the forerunner for the Savior. He's going to go ahead of him and prepare the way. And Zechariah said to the angel, verse 18, By what shall I know and be sure of this? Prove it to me, God. For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. <laughs> so here he's been praying for a child, but he already thinks he's too old to have one. He thinks his wife is too old. So look what happens. And the angel replied to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God and I have been sent to talk to you and to bring you this good news. Now behold, you will be 
and will continue to be silent and not able to speak until the day when these things take place because you have not believed what I told you but my words are of a kind which will be fulfilled in the appointed and the proper time. So God supernaturally shut Zachariah's mouth and I wouldn't mind to have a little of that sometime myself. <laughs> Amen. And he had to do it in order for his plan to come to pass in his life. The birth of this child was so important as a forerunner to the Messiah. And he could see, the angel could see from Zachariah's initial response and his first words that there was not much chance of that man verbally cooperating with the plan of God. And so God had to shut his mouth. And I just wonder how many of us mess up the plan of God for our life. Come on now. I just wonder how many wonderful things God has had planned and how many things he has planned now that if you were not at this conference, you would surely mess up by saying things that you shouldn't say. But thank God, because you're here this weekend, God is not going to have to supernaturally shut your mouth. You are going to learn. <laughs> Is anybody with me tonight? How many of you see that? Well, I guess I just better shut your mouth right now or we're never going to get this done. Our words are so, so important. Luke 10, 19, behold, I have given you authority and power. Not I will, I might, could be, hope so, maybe. I have given you, every one of you, that is a child of God, every person here watching by TV, listening in some way, if you're a child of God, you have authority and power. It's been given to you by God. Power to trample on serpents and scorpions and physical and mental strength and ability over all the power that the enemy possesses and nothing shall in any way harm you. Now, I'm sure some people think, well, yeah, if I got so much power, then why is my life such a mess? Because you can kill the power of God in your life. You can press it down, hinder it, keep it from flowing by speaking things that are not in agreement with God's plan and will for your life. God has equipped us, now listen to me, God has equipped us on the inside in our spirit with every single thing that we need to live a victorious life. Everything. When you're born again, the seed of God comes to live in you. That means that you're pregnant with everything that God is in your womb. When a woman becomes pregnant, her husband's seed is planted in her womb and the child grows and grows and grows and grows and develops and then it gives birth. Well, that's what happens when we receive Christ. We receive a seed of peace, a seed of righteousness, a seed of joy. We, everything comes to us as a seed. And as we water it with the Word of God and we let the Holy Spirit work in our lives to pull the weeds out of our life, and as we grow and we grow and we grow, then one thing after another after another, we give birth to these beautiful things that God has put in our life. And they become our experience rather than something we just read about and never experience. How many of you understand what I'm saying? So you don't even have to pray for peace. You've got peace. You need to pray that God will teach you how to walk in the peace that you have. You don't have to be, oh, God, I need joy. You say, no, God, I believe your joy is in me. Teach me how to not give up my joy. Teach me how to not let the devil steal my joy. We don't need to keep praying for something we've already got. We need to start making use out of it. You don't need to pray, God, give me power. You say, God, I believe that I have power on the inside of me. I'm agreeing with you. I believe that I have power on the inside of me. Now teach me how to walk in that power. You'll be amazed at how much different you'll feel if you'll just start to think and speak about what you already have. I mean, you'll just be like, I have power. Wow, I'm anointed. I have abilities. Instead of going around, I don't have any power, I don't have any peace, I don't have any joy, and nobody loves me. The power of life and death is in the tongue. 
You can turn your future around by learning how to say what God says. Well, the Lord wants to increase the release of this power in your life. He wants you to experience more of that power. He wants you to walk in the fullness of the anointing that you have. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not grieve the Spirit of God. Do not offend or vex or sadden him by whom you were sealed, marked, and branded as God's own. Now, in order for us to understand what grieves the Holy Spirit, we have to read the scriptures around this. Verse 29, let no foul or polluting language, nor evil word, nor unwholesome or worthless talk ever come out of your mouth. But only such speech as is good and beneficial to the spiritual progress of others, as is fitting to the need and the occasion, that it might be a blessing and give grace God's favor to those who hear it, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Verse 31, and let all bitterness and indignation and wrath, passion, rage, bad temper, resentment, anger, animosity, quarreling, brawling, clamor, contention, slander, evil speaking, abusive or blasphemous language be banished from you with all malice, spite, ill will, or baseness of any kind. <laughs> wow. I couldn't even tell you how many hours I've stared at these scriptures. Because I tell you, I do not want to offend, vex, or sadden the Holy Spirit. I don't want to do any damage to the anointing on my life. I don't want to do anything that would offend the Holy Spirit. You know what? I think sometimes we need, we talk a lot about freedom, and, I, and I'm big on being free. But you know what? I think we also need to sometimes live a little more carefully. Sometimes we can get so free that we just think that nothing matters, but there are things that matter to God. You can change things in your life dramatically by just getting with God on a regular basis and asking Him to help you with what you say. What do you talk about at the lunch table? What do you talk about with your friends? How do you talk about people? How do you talk about your boss at work? How do you talk about your life? How do you talk about yourself? What kind of things are you saying about your future? What kind of things are you saying about your past? A couple had pigeons on their window ledge, but they kept noticing one dove was there. And then they began to notice that when they argued or slammed the door, the dove would fly away, but the pigeons always remained. So my question to you tonight is, do you have pigeon religion? <laughs> Can the dove live at your house? Or is there too much arguing and bickering and banging and slamming going on? Come on. Man, you guys are quiet. The Holy Spirit is your unseen guest there all the time. He lives in you. He's promised to never leave you nor forsake you. <laughs> we don't want to offend the Holy Spirit. Don't have pigeon religion. Make the dove comfortable all the time. In the book of Acts, the early Christians we're told to go wait in an upper room until the Spirit or the promise of the Father would come from on high. And they waited. They waited for this special outpouring of the Spirit that Jesus said He would send. And in Acts chapter 2, it says, And when the time had fully come, suddenly, like a mighty wind, the Spirit came into the room, and tongues of fire settled on each of them, and they all began to speak in other languages. Now, I'm not going to give a long dissertation on the doctrine of speaking in tongues, but I do want to say that it's very interesting to me that the first area that the Holy Spirit touched yeah. why was the first place that the Holy Spirit touched their tongue? 
because he had a great thing that he was beginning in the earth. The birth of the church. A handful of ragtag people. And through those people and the anointing that God gave them, fishermen and tax collectors and people that weren't, were not educated, ex-prostitutes and all kinds of people that the world would have thrown away as trash, when the anointing of God comes on a person, it turns them into another man or another woman. And through that little band of ragtag, ordinary people, the name of Jesus is famous now worldwide. And there are millions of believers all over the world. And the more the devil tries to put that fire out, the more the church grows. God had to shut Zachariah's mouth to get what he wanted with him. And when he was trying to birth the church, he had to touch their mouths with his fire. You're going to see tomorrow that before God could use Isaiah, he had to touch his lips with burning coals from off the altar and cleanse his mouth. And I love what Isaiah says in Isaiah 6. He came into the presence of God and the glory filled the temple. And the first thing he said is, woe is me for I am ruined and undone for I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. When he came into the presence of God, the first thing he realized about himself, the first sin he realized was the words of his mouth. We should not praise God with one breath and curse men with the other. We have to get that kind of mixture out of our lives. And we cannot do it without a lot of help from God. There's no point in you going home and just saying, well, that's it, bless God, I'm going to shut my mouth. <laughs> no, what you want to do is go home and say, man, God, we got a lot of work to do. <laughs> I am not going to let the devil steal the plan of God for my life through having a loose mouth and saying stupid stuff that doesn't agree with God's word. Can anybody say amen? amen? Let's all stand up. Well, we got a good beginning. Has anybody been a little convicted? Amen. Seriously, did, did anybody really need this tonight? That... <laughs> Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us. We cannot do this without you. And I pray for myself, Lord, because I know after teaching this, I'm probably going to get tested, so please help me. <laughs> Give me some extra grace. Father, forgive us for the sins of our mouth and help us never offend the Holy Spirit by what we say. And the minute that we sense that we may have offended Him, to immediately repent and let You restore us to that right place again. Teach us, O oh God, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys have a great night. Love you. So renewing our mind, which means changing the way we think by studying and confessing God's word will enable us to really understand and receive his promises. You know, there's something so powerful about the word of God. And that's something that I really learned long before I was familiar with Joyce Meyer Ministries when I picked up a book about the power of words by, to me then, an unknown Joyce Meyer. And it really changed so much for me. Learning how to speak God's word and just making it a part of my life really made it so real and alive for me and in other people in my life. And it changed a lot of things for me. This is a little book that will help you see that same change in your life. This is Joyce's book called Power Words. And it's a great condensed little teaching that explains everything that God's Word says about what we speak and the power of it. In fact, on the back here it says, little changes can make a world of difference. And that is so true. This is the book that we are offering you today and we want you to pick this up. Just try it for yourself. You have nothing to lose. Just see what happens. So call us right now. Go to the website, JoyceMeyer.org. Don't wait any longer and get this little book for you today. See what happens in your life. You know, one of my very favorite things about Everyday Answers is the way that everyone is coming together, forming a community, and helping one another. And we have a lot of social media comments that 
not only uh, just say what's happening in your life, but really encourage each other. We asked a question on the show, how are you healing from grief and loss in your life? And these are some of the comments that we heard. Kat from Philadelphia said, prayer and looking at old pictures to remember good times. Beth from Miami said, it took me 14 years after my daughter was killed to actually take a step forward in my life but I just had to let go of the past. I've learned that forgiveness heals you and God will restore your life and make it better than it was. Wow, Beth, thank you for that. Faith in California says, my son Benjamin would have been four years old this year. God's grace and knowing Benjamin is surrounded with light and love keeps me going. And Obriella from Wisconsin said, I'm not usually on Facebook, but reading everyone's comments is humbling. I lost my sister on New Year's. I'm sorry for everyone else's loss, and I pray the peace of God will comfort you like nothing else can. This is why we ask you to share so that together we can all discover hope and healing, restoration and answers together through our collective experiences with Christ. It's what he wants for all of us and that's why he gave us one another. So share your story today. We would love to hear how do you keep your hopes up when your circumstances appear hopeless. Do it on Facebook, Joyce Meyer Ministries Facebook page, or on Twitter, use hashtag EA, and that way we can all share together. And be sure to be here next time on Everyday Answers. Life is not easy. We all know that. But God has equipped us with the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit